Joe Big House. Ken, you are inside the house, powered by Dynamic Fitness and Strength, building the better athlete. In this episode, we introduce you to Dr. Brandon Marcello, human performance strategist. And we're going to talk about the topic sleep. And we're going to discuss his four obstacles of sleep and how to improve those for a better sleep score. We'll speak about light, noise, temperature, and pain, as well as sleep depth, sleep hygiene, and others. Now, on to the show. Hey, this is Joe Ken for Inside the House, and we are here with Brandon Marcello, one of my all-time favorites, one of my go-to guys, expert in many things that I'm not, and one of those topics today is sleep. And specifically what I want to talk to Brandon about is one of the articles he had published in Muscle and Fitness. It was uh, February 2020, and it was called Rest Easy. And it touched on four obstacles of sleep. So we want to keep this within about 20 minutes to 30 minutes for you, the viewers. And I'm going to turn it over to Brandon. And we're going to talk about these four obstacles of sleep. And then I'll do some Q&A with them after. His first one is light. Then he talks about noise, temperature, and pain. So here we are with Brandon Marcello. Brandon, thanks for being with us. No, my pleasure, Coach. I always appreciate you uh, reaching out, and always good to connect. So it's good to see each other too. Usually we talk yeah, on no the phone, question. but yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. So sleep, you know, it, it, that was uh, how that started. Was saying, well, what are the biggest barriers that most people experience when it comes to sleep or sleep disruptions? Like, what are the things that are getting in people's way uh, to really getting a good night's rest? And as you mentioned, the first one was light. And I think that that's kind of makes sense. It's, it's hard to sleep when there's, there's two types of light, right? There's the sunlight from outside. Um, then there's also artificial light, which is a, a result of our, you know, artificial environment that we have in our homes and, and smartphones and things of that nature. So ideally, you know, with light, it's that we want a really dark room, as dark as possible. What we call those are time cues, meaning that these are things which might indicate what time of day it is. So like if you wake up in the middle of the night and your window's open, you can see it's dark out, you know it's in the middle of the night. But if all of a sudden it starts to get lighter out, you're like, okay, it's probably getting close to waking up. So we want to avoid those time cues. So one, we want our rooms to be as dark as possible. We want to um, get rid of as much light as possible. Some people are going to be now more sensitive to light than others, right? So like someone like myself, that little light that's on your TV that little red light, like in a hotel room, that bothers me, right? That get, so some people it doesn't bother at all, but it bothers me. So I cover that up with like electrical tape. Um, if I'm on the road, I'll throw like a towel underneath the door to hotel um, just to kind of block that extra light. Um, I'll clip, clip the uh, curtain shut, right? Cause you know, that sun always finds its way into those hotel curtains. And even at home, I try to have as dark of a room as possible. Um, now the thing about now is I have to operate a little differently because as you know, I got a couple little kids at home, so it's important to have some night lights around in case they get up and start wandering and find their way. And, you know, if we have to get up and go to one of them in the middle of the night, it's a little bit easier to find their way too. So kind of that, that takes some getting used to for me. The other type of light is like the stuff you get from your devices, right? The, the, the they say blue light. And the theory behind that is when they say blue light, it's not necessarily the color blue, but it's that the um, light from the, the, there's a spectrum of light and there's a blue end of the spectrum. It's right around 450 nanometers is, is the number. That's really insignificant, but we don't perceive it, but our eyes do. And what that does is sunlight happens to give off a lot of blue light, which also suppresses melatonin. So the reason why people say to stay away from this type of light, because um, these also give off a lot of blue light, is because then that suppresses melatonin and would make it harder to go to sleep. Now, there has been some recent research, albeit in mice, that says maybe not so much true. So I think more to come on that. I think right now I'm operating under the same same thoughts as previously, which is probably eliminate blue light and mitigate blue light. But I am keeping an eye on the current research to say, well, maybe there's something there. Maybe it's not as big of an impact 
as it was, but certainly it's, it's there. So that was light. Okay, but you talked about blue light and like suppressing melatonin. And one of, the, one of the things that I've tried to do, I don't do a good enough job of it with that is, is using those glasses when I'm using my like iPad or iPhone as it's closer to sleep time. Is yeah. There, is, that, is there merit in that? Is, that? is there being shown that that actually helps or is, it, or is it based off of the quality of the glasses you buy? It is based off the quality of the glasses in which you purchase. So for instance, um, the, the ones I have, I got a pair right here, actually. Um, these are my Uvex Skyper. They're like $8 on Amazon, right? You can see they got the orange tint. Um, they're not fashionable. They are not fashion forward <laughs> at all. So if, if you're thinking this is what's, you know, uh, those block out about 99% of the blue light. Right now, if you get on, there's, there's other ones. Um, some of the gaming glasses, they don't block oh, yeah. out 99%. Some are like 50, some are 25, some are like 60. So you really have to do your research and kind of look into it and see what might be the better one for you, right? Because they're not all equal. Just because they have blue light blocking capabilities doesn't mean they're going to be as effective as the other one. So, yeah, that's, I, I always go with those because they're cheap and they work. Then you talked about with the light. One thing that I've noticed, and we talked about this a couple of days ago, that I highly recommend is like an eye mask. I, oh, I've, yeah, yeah, for I've sure. Seen the quality of my sleep, it, it sounds funny, but it's not. Like that eye mask puts you almost in, it's pitch dark even when it's dark. Yep, eye mask is great. I mean, like I said, if you have night lights or if you have like um, uh, blinds that allow light in, um, and it disrupts your sleep totally get an eye mask. Um, but you know, eye masks are going to be like mattresses, right? It's an individuality thing. So people with long eyelashes don't like eye masks because they, they touch and that freaks right. them out a little bit, but they make other eye masks that actually sit a little bit farther away from the eyes. So, you know, find one that, that are comfortable, find them that, that you would like. And uh, absolutely, 100% a great addition to, to your, you know, your, your sleep kit. Yeah, my eye mask actually has like a little foam circle that goes around that actually raises off. So I've got, yeah, I got a pretty good set. I'm, I'm actually real happy with mine. And, and before we jump into the next point, because you brought it up with suppressing melatonin, I had this as part of my notes. And we talk a lot about different supplementation. Is there value in melatonin supplementation to help with sleep? Because we talked about like cost analysis and also like, is it a crutch if you use melatonin and you don't need to use melatonin? I don't think you need to use melatonin. Um, if you go to a sleep specialist and they say, yes, I'd like you to try melatonin, then I think it's totally, absolutely 100% worth doing. But just from the general population standpoint, the otherwise healthy individual, um, no. I, I think the thing you have to remember is this. When, when people prescribe melatonin, when you know, uh, physicians um, and people who are you know, medical professionals in the world of sleep, the lowest dosage is typically uh, 0.25 milligrams, okay? That's the low end, all the way up to five milligrams, right around five, five to six milligrams. So that's a big range, right? So people would say, well, then why just don't I just take five or six milligrams? Because one of the side effects of too much melatonin is you can't sleep. So relying on melatonin and just this arbitrary number, like most supplements will have three milligrams, maybe, because remember, they're not regulated by the FDA. Right. And because they're not regulated, they may have three, they might have four, they might have one. Um, it could be different from uh, pill bottle to pill bottle. So um, mel people love to go to the melatonin um, with supplements and think it's like the end all be all with sleep. But at the end of the day, there's, it, it could backfire on you. Um, and again, only if it's recommended by, you know, I an expert, I wouldn't go it, go with it. There's probably some other things which you could take care of, like light, noise, temperature, pain, that may be a barrier which which could fix the problem for you. Well, I know I was on it and you told me to stop and I didn't really 
figure. I didn't see any difference on it or off it. I think, again, it comes a lot to, and we'll talk a little bit about like your, your sleep patterns and scheduling. Okay, point yeah. two, noise. One of the things in the article you wrote about was a white noise machine. Yeah. Can you talk yeah. a little bit, and we all understand about the disruptions of noise, uh, if the TV's on in the other room too loud because other people are up, but uh, I've talked to you about this too with like the different types of apps that are out there and that could help calm you down. And, and again, the, the, again, is it a crutch or is it something necessary? What are your, give us some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think uh, like a white noise or pink noise machine is a crutch. I think it is there to kind of combat some of these barriers or obstacles that could prevent you from getting a good night's rest. And the thing about it is, um, is that, many times your sleep can be disrupted by noise and you may not even realize it. Meaning it might be an imperceivable awakening. It could be just enough noise to pull you out of a deep sleep, but not enough of a noise to wake you up. So you may not even know that your sleep has been disrupted as much. Um, you know, like a sprinkler head might go off in your backyard next to your window um, and you may not realize it, it doesn't wake you up, but it could disrupt your sleep, right? Um, could be uh, birds outside, it could be a trash, um, you know, a garbage truck rolling through your neighborhood. Um, heck, it could be a number of different things. So what the, the thing with white noise is, white noise is just random noise that covers the entire sound spectrum so that every frequency is taken care of so that it hopefully will dampen out any other noise that comes along through any frequency so it won't disrupt your sleep. Now, when you do choose a white noise machine, um, I went to Target and got ours. I have them in everybody's room in the house. Um, and it's really a fan. It kind of just makes a noise and you can turn it and make it louder or you know, softer and change the pitch a little bit. And the reason I like that is because it's always random. It's not like an app where it like has like, it'll go for five minutes and you'll start over. And maybe you can you discern that and all of a sudden you start listening and waiting for it to start over and then that disrupts your sleep. So I like the ones that come without any type of, you know, app attached, I just like a fan. That's why a lot of people like fans, not only just for the temperature, yeah, which we is what we're gonna talk about we next, but also because of the noise. So, okay, so as we're talking to, you know, the people out, out there listening, couple of things on that. So I, I, on one of the apps I use, and it's interesting you said with the fan about changing the frequencies because the app that I've used, and I've used two different apps with the app that I was using, and I haven't used it in a while because things are going well for me. It, it actually had specific frequencies, like it would have deep sleep frequency, meditation freak. I mean, it had these different things and you just slide the graph to what you wanted and put on the time. The, the, thing, the thing that I want to ask you, because I did feel the one of the negatives of some of these apps was you have to wear headsets. Mm. And that kind of, so now here I am sleeping with a pair of headsets and an eye mask. Sometimes that's not comfortable enough to fall asleep either. And you're trying to do all these things to get to sleep. So in, in, the, in the white noise machine you recommend, it, it, that's obviously not a headset based thing and it seems like it's not very specific it it seems it's more user friendly to the sleep conscious person athlete uh, weekend warrior type than okay i gotta get prepared i gotta put my headsets on i gotta get my app going you just run this like you would a typical fan right so it's i think it's like the one i got was like 40 bucks at target and if you buy a pair of these now you're up to 48 bucks yeah. if you buy a sleep mask I don't know what those cost, 10 bucks? Yeah, I think right? mine was like 15 because I got the extra, the extra nice one. All right, 15 bucks. So, you know, you're 50, you're at 45, 50, you're at 55 bucks right now uh, and investing into quality sleep. That's not a bad return of investment right there so far. Well, especially like when you said those who have used melatonin without doctor's recommendations are spending you know, how many on a, how many times a year on a bottle of melatonin that like you right. said, they may not necessarily need. Right. Totally. hundred percent. Temperature. Why 67 degrees? Like where did the science come up with 
a very specific number of 67 degrees. And it's funny because I, I remember talking to a buddy of mine who's now an athletic director, but when he was a football ops director for a Big East team, they would even talk about setting them reading rooms at like 62 degrees to keep them cold so that guys wouldn't fall asleep in meetings. And I'm like, where did these random numbers come out? But why, where did six, why 67? Like, where's the magic number of 67? So 67, 68, right around there, you know, there's like a little bit of a range there. It's not actually, you know, it's not beyond the money, but where that number came from where that number came is the fact that when the, there's temperature fluctuations that the body goes through at night. Um, and certain, certain things can disrupt sleep. And one of the things that can disrupt sleep because of these temperature fluctuations is our ambient temperature of our room or our environment. And if a room is too hot, okay, it can cause us to have a more restless night. It can wake us up. Um, it may not be enough to wake us up, but we could toss and turn a lot. The cooler the environment, the more likely it is that we will stay in a deeper sleep, right? And follow normal sleep architecture. And obviously the colder it gets, and obviously it's, it's like a curvilinear relationship, right? It's that sweet spot, right? You know, the Goldilocks thing, right? Too hot, not good. Too cold, not good. So that 67 number is, is right around ideal for most. Now, the tricky part of this is, is if you share the room, your right. bedroom with somebody else, there is typically a fight. It's too hot. It's too cold. So there is this thing. We have them at our house. Um, we have, they're called chili pads. Um, my wife has one on her side. I have one on my side. And we turn them on at night. And they're, they go on your mattress. And it filters water through it. Okay? And then you can set it to whatever temperature you want. So I can set mine at like 68. She could put hers at like 65. Um, and... There you go. You, you can make it warmer if you want. So everybody can have their own independent temperature, um, regardless of what the environment of the room is. So if you say, okay, we'll keep the room at 67, but you can set your chili pad warmer. It doesn't affect me because it's on their side of the bed. So um, the other thing I like about the chili pads is that they do make white noise because there's a fan in them. Oh, so, so you get a double whammy. You need a double whammy if you want, right? So, but that's one of the big things. That's why a lot of people also sleep with fans because it kind of cools them off. Um, also thinking about your mattress. Um, and this goes back to the individual preference, right? Like, so people say, well, Brandon, what mattress should I buy? I had that question next. <laughs> you did, right? So it's like, well, what are your biggest problems? Is it because, are you waking up because your partner moves a lot? Maybe if that's the case, then you want to find a mattress that doesn't have a lot of motion transfer. Um, right. So like waterbeds, probably not your best choice. Right. Um, if temperature is an issue, right. Well then maybe you think about a mattress with cooling technology. If you don't want to get a chili pad, maybe you buy a mattress that helps dissipate body heat better because you happen to be a hot sleeper. Right. Um, maybe it's pain, right. Which is another one of our, our, our barriers to sleep, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but you know, it comes down to maybe you need to find something that gives you better support or, can kind of take support off multiple positions of your, of your body when you're on your side, right? So instead of all the weight being held on your shoulder, maybe it dissipates forces a little bit better. So um, looking at those things from an individual standpoint and say, what are my own individual problems? Why am I having a hard time falling asleep, right? Uh, and maybe that your partner snores, right? Ties back into the noise thing. Maybe a white noise machine will help. Maybe it's earplugs. Um, Maybe it's propping them up. Maybe it's getting them to a sleep specialist because maybe they have apnea, right? A lot of things, but at least you can start, start with what is impacting me? Or what is stopping me from getting a good night's sleep? Yeah, I, I found like adding memory foam was a good add-on for me. And what I, it took me, I, I went to training camp for nine years and we were using dormitory type beds mm -hmm. and I would have the worst sleep for like seven of them. And then I finally started bringing my memory foam down to put on the top in the last two years with some of the best night's sleep I had at training camp because of the mattress, which you brought up. And that leads to me before we jump into the next one is hotel rooms on the road. You're on the road. You're used to your, used to your mattress. 
what recommendations, because I know this, the, I, when I'm on a bad mattress in a hotel, I'm going to have a bad, it's a bad night's sleep. I'm all over the place. I'm trying to reset pillows. Try, Cause I usually, yep. I would say the large majority of the time I'm up, I sleep on my back and then there's times I'll, yep. I'll roll to my side, but overall, man, there's just bad deals. What can you do on the road that can help change that for you? Well, a couple of things that I do and not every, I get, not everybody has the ability to do this, but, um, I, I, how I choose my hotels is based upon the type of bed they use. Like I will not sleep in a Radisson because the Radisson has this partnership with sleep number beds. And I find the sleep number beds to be incredibly uncomfortable. Now, if people love sleep number beds, then Radisson's your hotel. Right. But I, you know, I, I, I'm very particular. So I go to Marriott's because I'm comfortable. Their beds are always the same. Um, every once in a while you might get a bad one, but, um, they also have my preferences, my room preferences online. So they know I want a high floor away from the street and far away from the elevator. So they are all, so I, I'm setting myself up for the best night's sleep possible. Right. So you can actually get that information if I call like different hotel chains. So you like can put it in your, put it in your, your, your account, like your, uh, your Marriott reward yeah. stuff, your Marriott Bonvoy. Yep. They know I always want my, I want high floor farthest away from the elevator. And so it, let's just talk about like, you brought up Marriott, not that we're, we're recommend, we're, we're promoting yeah. different things. <laughs> so all the different like subsidiaries of Marriott, whatever those other type of hotel chains are, Generally, they'll all utilize the same, same mattresses. Typically. Yeah. Yeah. That's really like if you cool. went to like, like, start doing some, I don't remember this it was years ago when I was looking at mattresses to buy for myself. I'm like, man, you know, when I used to stay in Sheraton's boy, they were really comfortable. What did they use? Right. So I called them up and I think they use like the Simmons beauty rest or something. I don't even remember. So I started trying those and I'm like, okay, this is, this is getting in the right direction. <laughs> It, that, that, now that right there might be the tip of the whole, the whole interview right there is, Hey man, find out who, what kind of places have the mattresses you like. Okay. Last one pain. I think that's probably easily to understand, but yeah. what, give us a couple of pointers of moving forward. Like you said about talk about mattresses uh, and I've had the same thing, throbbing shoulders, when I had a lot of low back issues that I've actually cleaned up and sleep way better. But I remember like when you're saying with the pain, when I, when my back was so beat up, I literally had to sleep like a V I had that pillows propping me up this way. And, and I had a big uh, foam cushion, like a big 90 to prop my, my feet up to alleviate the compression of, of laying down flat. I mean, obviously that's not ideal. And I learned through uh, doing some different, doing all the training you told me to do back in the day that I told you was <laughs> foolish. Now I spend more time doing that and I sleep better. Maybe I should have listened to you. <laughs> it's all right. It's all good, right? Yeah. At least uh, I listened, right? Yes, it took me 12 years, but I listened. <laughs> You're always evolving. That's <laughs> one, thing, one of the many things I love about you. You're always getting better. Always getting better. Um, so, so with pain, it's funny because um, pain impacts how you sleep and a lack of sleep impacts pain and perception of pain. So the less sleep you get, the more aches and pains, bumps and bruises feel more pronounced, right? So it's a vicious cycle when we're talking about that. So exactly what you said, if you have issues with pain, one say, okay, what is it? Is it the way I'm training? Is it the way my work environment, is it my bed? Maybe my mattress is like, you should only have a mattress for 10 years. So if you have a mattress that's like, you know, 15 years old, you might be like, you know what, maybe it's my mattress. So all of a sudden you change your mat. If you wake up in the morning stiff, right? I think maybe you might need to look in the mattress. Some other things to do. Um, I have a wind down routine. My wife has a wind down routine where we use some, you know, rolling techniques, um, uh, mobility techniques, soft tissue techniques. Sometimes we'll pull out like the little hyper ice gun, yeah. uh, hyper 
you know, those types of things, whatever tool, it doesn't have to be hyper ice, could be anything. Right. Um, but to target our specific areas that are troublesome and it helped immensely. So having a wind down routine, you know, everything else in your life is built around routine. So for you not to have anything built around sleep is absolutely ridiculous, right? It's like, we just think we can just hop in bed and it should, it should work perfectly, right? Um, and it's just simply not that easy. So those things can help mitigate pain. See a good physical therapist, find a good chiropractor. Um, my advice for finding a good chiropractor is if you can't, if you go to a chiropractor and you don't know if they're a PT or a chiropractor, they're a good chiropractor, right? Um, no so, I, found, you know, I found two of those in the Charlotte area that were just aces. I mean, right. Straight money machine, like, whoa, big time. And you might have to go to somewhere to help, help get your pain alleviated, right? And then that's the other thing to do is see a professional who can help prescribe corrective exercises or at least determine what, the, what, what the, uh, the best path for care might be. And maybe it is going to see an orthopedic surgeon. I don't know, but you know, it's, it's going down all those roads and exhausting it and making sure you can, because you can take care of it, right? So, yeah. That, yeah, that was... That's critical. That, that, I think another good nugget right off the bat for anybody out there is, you know, the 10 year old mattress. That's, I'm going to go in there right now and ask my wife, how many years have we, we've had our mattress? Because that's, that, that's good quality stuff. That's easy things that we can change that can help, help us get what we need, especially if we're doing any type of performance related or physical fitness activity on a daily basis. Which leads me to the last point of this article. You talked about sleep debt. And I know we, I've read a several articles, not just by you, but by other people talking about how do you, if you fall, find yourself in sleep debt, it's hard to make up those hours. And that's why people recommend napping. And you had brought up about if you're falling asleep around three o'clock or after lunch, you feel tired, you're probably in sleep debt. So my, my question on the sleep debt is, obviously you hear the different things, seven to 10 hours of sleep, but there's gotta be a truth of quantity of sleep's one thing, quality of sleep's another. And is yep. the quality of sleep, if you can get more hours of quality sleep, is the actual duration that important and if i am in sleep debt and like how do i do things to manage that i know one thing that i've heard from numerous people is trying to stay in your routine of if i go to bed 10 o'clock every night and wake up six o'clock every morning don't think on the weekends i'm going to sleep to 11 and make up what i lost during the week so yeah, so sleep debt, it builds up over time. Um, and the most sleep debt we think you can have as Carrie is right around 50 hours of sleep. So it's not like, man, I, have, I must have 6,000 hours. No, it's gonna tap out around 50 is what we believe today. So you can chip away at it little by little. When you start to chip away at that sleep debt, that's when you start to see you know, a, lo a lot of the really amazing things of performance and really a lot of things that we can do as humans become unlocked. Um, I don't think it's a hack. I think it's just, this is how we should be performing. And what we do is we're performing substandard. And then when all of a sudden we get good sleep, we're like, wow, what a great performance hack. It's like, no, now you're just working optimally, right? right. You're not working like way better. This is just where you should be. Yeah. It's nothing um, like you went like, oh man, I've got this magic supplement. No, you just, you're, this is what you're supposed to be like. You've been just behind yes. the other days. <laughs> Exactly. This is exactly where you're supposed to be. Right. Um, so, yeah, so you can pay it back over time. Um, but again, you know, it takes time. It takes patience. You should try to elongate your time in bed because um, that increases the likelihood that you're going to get more sleep and better sleep. So, yeah, it's about it's a it's a combination. To answer your question between a quantity and quality. You need both. Um, and then also over time, you want to try and stick to those same times, right? And then that can tie into like chronotype. Are you a lark or an owl? Meaning, you know, are you an early to, early to bed, early to rise person? Or are you like a uh, late to bed, late to rise person, right? Or you could fall somewhere in between. 
And typically that's determined by how you would sleep on an off day. So like not during the work week, right. if you were just to have your on an off day and you say, okay, if it was, I was an off day, I'd go to bed at like midnight and I'd wake up at nine if I can do that. Right. So we probably know that you're going to be more of an owl. There's more to it than that, but essentially that's kind of how you start is by looking at sleep on off days. And then the likelihood that you're going to get better sleep or better quality sleep um, is increased there too. Cause like if I, I'm an owl, uh, so I would like to go to bed around midnight, maybe later, um, go midnight to 8 AM would be ideal for me. Right. And if I got those eight hours, but I went to bed like at 10 and woke up at six, I feel completely different. I feel terrible. So those are some things you have to consider. Sometimes it may not be that it may not come down to the quantity and quality of sleep. Sometimes it may come down to when you're sleeping as well. Yeah. It's funny. Cause when I, when obviously in a team setting, when I was working with the team and my schedule was a lot different, my routine was different. I was at eight to four. Like I'd go to bed at eight o'clock at night and be up at four and be ready to roll. Now I seem to be, cause my, schedules change my routines change i'm more of a 10 to 6 10 to 6 30 and it's funny because when i'd come home on the weekends when i was an eight to four guy it looked it looked more like that 10 to 6 30 because now i'm interacting with my family and you know my wife's more of a midnight to seven Mm. where I need a little bit more sleep than she does. But I've found now, like my routine now is starting to be, you know, around that 10-ish, 6 to 6.30 and start my day then, which in some ways I, I, I tend to feel guilty because usually by 6.30 back in the old day, I'd be like halfway into a workout or a mm. training session. So it's kind of changed. But I all, but then again, then I look at it from, I always felt my best training time for me personally during a training week was around, you know, 10 a.m. So I'm kind of still looking at things at this point in the training as far as that. But I do notice that if you're erratic and you're going to bed times, it throws everything off. Like if oh. you're trying to go to bed one day at eight because you got to get up at four to do something versus the next day you're at 10 then you're at six and then you're at 11 and nine. And then it, it's just not, it's not cope aesthetic to a quality long-term process of being in optimal, like you said, in the optimal position to have a pretty solid day. Yeah. So like the example, we, we call it sleep hygiene, right? That's what we call it when it's quantity, qu quality, quantity, and consistency of that quality and quantity. And it's no different using your analogy you just spoke about, the consistency, than brushing your teeth, right? You just don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I'm just going to brush my bottom teeth today. That's it, right? Maybe I'll do my top tomorrow. Maybe I'll do my front teeth on Wednesday, right? You do quality, you do the same quantity, and you're consistent with your teeth every day. Why? Because you know the downside of not doing that you know that there are some consequences. There is a cost of doing business that way. So, and sleep is no different, right? There is, if you have that inconsistency and the quantity and quality is off, don't expect feeling great. Don't expect longevity. Don't expect great strength gains. Don't expect uh, optimal op uh, metabolism of foods. Um, you're gonna encounter anxiety. You're gonna have, you're gonna get cranky. You're gonna, not gonna be as cognitively sharp. I mean, just expect it, right? You guys, no, no pun intended here. You sleep in the bed you make, right? Right. And if you're not sleeping, you're, that's what you're going to get. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up like this. I've got three little sub subjects that I want to bring to your attention and just give you a chance to pop off on these. One is weighted blankets, then caffeine consumption, and then the third one is, I, I've talked to you about this before, but I wanted to see if you've got any more info and the, the effects of utilizing CBD with sleep and recovery. Okay. So um, weighted blankets show immense benefit. Uh, people love them. Uh, people seem to get great sleep. Um, I think they're fantastic and I think you should try them, right? All for it. Um, caffeine 
Different people metabolize caffeine differently, okay? But we know that what caffeine does, it attaches to the same receptors that the molecules which kind of uh, make us sleepy attach to. So if it blocks those receptors, we don't feel as tired, okay? So it kind of it blunts that sleep pressure, so to speak. Um, so having caffeine too much, too late, if you're a slow metabolizer, whatever, can prevent you from getting a good night's sleep, right? Um, 100%. So like for me, I have caffeine in the morning and that's it. I don't do the monsters. I don't <laughs> do the other stuff, right? And, and now again, <laughs> we've talked about this before. <laughs> you can become desensitized to caffeine a little bit, right? But at the end of the day, it still does what it does. You may right. not feel the effects of the caffeine, but it still performs the same way physiologically in your body and starts to block those receptors. So it can impact your ability to fall asleep at night. Um, last one, CBD. The trick about CBD is that it is illegal, still illegal at the federal level. So therefore it's hard to do federally funded research on something which is deemed illegal by the federal government. Because of the recent changes and states making some changes, now there seems to be some changes what the federal government is doing and allowing certain groups to do research on cannabis and CBD and other derivatives from cannabis. So uh, that's something to stay tuned uh, for here in the near future. But right now it's going to be all anecdotal. What anecdotal means is it worked for you, right? Let me just be clear about what anecdotal is. That's like saying I got up this morning and I had eggs for breakfast. Therefore, anecdotally, everybody had eggs for breakfast this morning. That's not the case, right? So some people did. So we know that it's probably going to work for some, but it's probably not going to work for everybody. My other thought with that is because I, uh, I know some people that study it too, is I wonder how much when they do be able to do, when they are able to do that research, how much the percentage of THC that's in the product has an effect because I know sure. – there, there are some products that have no, no THC and it's just yep. CBD oil, but then there's some with high quality potency of THC. Right. And I think those are the products that a lot of ex-athletes are, are utilizing to help in pain relief. Well, sure. Right. Absolutely. I mean, like anything, it's like any drug, right? It, if it dampens the pain response. That's a good thing. So. Okay. Last question, because this is something we talked about the other day when we were talking, I want to bring it up because I'm sure yeah. I'm not the only one that sometimes has this issue. And you brought it up. Some type of movement, so your kids come to get you during the middle of the night, you have yeah. to wake up and go to the bathroom. I know I have sometimes a hard time getting back to sleep in an expedient fashion. I, I do know sometimes like I want to get back into bed so fast that I'm like, my, my heart is racing and I'm breathing heavy because I'm like, I, I got to jump back in, get the covers on, and I got to close my eyes. And you almost overthink going yep. back to sleep. Or you, you're always in that constant thought of, and I call it because of a meditation, monkey mind, where just numerous yeah, things because yeah. you're up or running through your head. And now you're laying there and now you're like, oh man, I can't go back to sleep. And then the next thing you know, you can't go back to sleep. And, you're, and you get up and you start your day and then you want to know why, like you said, at three o'clock or noon, you're tired again because you're in sleep debt because it didn't work out. Is there any, like, just a couple of quick hacks of, like, calming yourself down when you have those middle of the night uh, unanticipated or even anticipated, like, again, uh, as a 50-plus-year-old man, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. I'm going to go to the bathroom sometime in the middle of the night. Yeah. So, uh, so it, one depends. <laughs> no, you're not ready for depends yet. Yeah. No, so I, I think the one thing to remember is that if you already have a good foundation of good sleep, good quantity, good quality, and good consistency, so good sleep hygiene, if you have a bad night's rest, don't panic. If you get disturbed in the middle of the night and get woken up at three in the morning, it's okay. You're going to perform just fine. One bad night's rest, two bad night's rest is not going to crush you, right? Now, when you have a ton of sleep debt and you do that, different story, right? 
Now, in terms of getting your mind back and slowing things down, this is where, and you've been doing this for years, we've talked about this, meditation. And you said to me, you haven't been as good as you were previously with it, but you said you need to start ramping it back up. If you can go in and lie down and start to focus on nothing, clear your mind, maybe do some deep breathing, um, like four, seven, eight breathing, which is inhale for four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. Do that four or five cycles of breath. That can help wind you back down and, and, and uh, eliminate and focus on something else, not allow your thoughts to cloud and interfere with your sleep. So, you know, again, it's going back to that pre-bed routine. If you have that, it's a great time to start meditating. It's a great time to focus on that because these strategies will come in handy when you need to deploy them. And those are the times when it would be like in the middle of the night. So again, deep breathing, uh, meditation to clear your mind. Or if there's something that came to mind that you really feel like you need to take care of, put that pad next to your bed, write it down. You know it's there and deal with it in the morning. Gotcha. Hey, Brandon, we can't thank you enough for coming out today. It went longer than I thought, but the information was gold and I knew it would be. I can't wait to get this out. Uh, tell us where we can find you on your social media outlets. So uh, I have a Twitter is probably my best. Like I put, I have Instagram, but I post mostly silly stuff. Posted my daughter grabbing a heavy kettlebell this morning. There, there on, you go. On That's Instagram. what I might repost that <laughs> one when we promote it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, uh, Twitter, it's bmarcello13. Um, and then I have a, a, a web page, uh, brandonmarcellophd.com. Um, I have a few blogs on there. Uh, but Twitter probably is where you'll find most of my information. Like I said, Instagram, if you're curious about random crap and me making pizza, <laughs> you can follow me on there if you want. But I, hey, I appreciate you having me. It's always a pleasure. And you know, I'd do anything for you. So uh, yeah, appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. And again, we learned a lot. Of, I mean, these are the topics again for us that these are, these are important. It's not just about squatting, benching, and throwing med balls. Uh, nutrition and sleep, we've said it for years. And now it's all of a sudden important. Like now they're the topics to be spoken about. And it's funny because, you know, it's like anything else. You're, you're, not, you're not going to out-train a bad diet and you're probably not going to out-train a bad night's sleep. You could probably say both of that. And to have people like yourself that have really dived into it and can give us, I mean, this is practical information. I mean, this is, yeah. I, don't, I don't need to understand reading research and, that, and that's what I've always appreciated about you is your ability to take what you've studied from a research point and give it to the, the people like myself who like to say they live in a practical world. But, you know, and again, we all know science and the practicality of training all tie in one way or the other. And it's good for me to know that I've got guys like yourself that I can always call and get some good answers. So, again, thanks a lot. We appreciate it, and we look forward to talking to you next time. All right, brother. Thanks again.